Oh no, all of them do it too. Uh, okay, just play it, just play it down. Mm -hmm. Seconds and, and I would have been late, huh? Yep. Well, according to the clock here, I am late. So. We're still waiting for a lawyer. We need one more person. Yeah, we need person. a lawyer because we have an open meeting and somebody has to adjudicate the thing. Pardon me? I suppose you could start without the lawyer. Well, it's always nice to have legal representation here. Excuse me, do we know when our legal representation will be here? I'll email her right now, but I believe we could go ahead and begin the preliminaries if you wanted to open the meeting. Okay, all right, thank you. I have a question of technology. I, I don't understand what's on my screen. Here's the man to talk to. Yes, I figured that's what I needed to do. Thank you very much. Oh, you're on. Yes, please. Thank you. Sweet. Okay. Thank you so much. This is January 10th. It is now 3.02. This is the Open Space Advisory Board. Do we have a quorum? Yes, we do. Okay. The meeting is called to order. Time limits for information presentations. There is a 15-minute time limit for presentations with additional time granted at the discretion of the presiding officer. This limitation is applicable only to the presentation itself and does not include discussion and action items of an uh, elements of an item. Call to the public. Do we have the list, please? At this time, members of the public will be allowed three minutes to present with additional time granted at the discretion of the presiding officer. Okay. Madam Chair, all staff members, so glad that you're here and doing great work as far as open space is concerned. Uh, my ongoing concern is that our elected officials are insufficiently care about pres preservation of open space. Whenever there is uh, elected officials talking about our wonderful city, I don't hear them mention so things such as the Franklin Mountain State Park or even outdoor activities. They talk about uh, more uh, big box stores and uh, chain restaurants and those are everywhere. You can go any place and find one of those, but this is the only place where you can find the largest urban park in the nation. And it's up to you. It's in your hands to bring awareness to our elected officials at the city level. So I ask that you do meet with your, the person that put you on the OSAP board, the city representative or mayor, 
and encourage them to have an appreciation for our open space, maybe even get out there in our park. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Are there any other persons signed up for to speak? Uh, no, Madam Chair, that was the only person. Thank you very much. Are there any changes to the agenda? Yes, uh, Jeff Howell for the record. Um, item eight, um, we're requesting that that item be postponed to the uh, February o Open Space Advisory Board meeting, just to allow us to have sufficient time to uh, look into that item. Which uh, item was that? That is the item regarding the Keystone Heritage Park. Okay. Thank you. Item number eight, correct? Item eight, yes, that's correct. Okay. Are there any other additions or corrections, changes to the agenda? That's the only correction, yes, or addition. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're looking at approval of the minutes I now. the agenda, or the uh, minutes of the last meeting be accepted as, as they stand? Are there, is Second. there? Second. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that the minutes of the prior meeting be um, accepted as they stand. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? The meeting, uh, the minutes for the December 6th meeting are accepted as they stand. Number, item number three, information discussion quarterly report from the planning division. And this is by Mr. Uh, Ortiz. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. Nelson Ortiz with Planning and Inspections. Good afternoon. This report is going to cover all of the plats that were approved by the City Plan Commission between October 5th and December 14, 2017. There were actually a total of seven applications, all within the Hillside Development Area. The first one was Cimarron Sage Commercial Park Unit 5. That was approved by CPC on October 5th. The second one, Carlo Gonzo Medical Buildings, approved October 19th. Third, Coronado High School, approved November 16th. Montesillo Unit 11, approved November 30th. Also approved on November 30th was ROP Office. On December 14th, CMC Commercial Replat A was approved. And also on December 14th was Desert Springs Unit 5. Oh, okay. This is the location map for Cimarron Sage Commercial Park Unit 5. And the aerial. Cimarron Sage Commercial Park Unit 5 was a major combination application. The applicant proposed to subdivide approximately 22 acres into 11 commercial lots, one public retention pond, a 0 0.029 acre of open space and four streets. Access to the subdivision uh, was proposed uh, from Northwestern Drive, Paseo del Norte Drive, and Resler Drive. The development was reviewed under the previous subdivision ordinance and reviewed for its compliance with the Rancho Las Lomas concept plan and land study. So again, the CPC recommended approval on October 5th. The second one is Carlo Gonzo Medical Buildings. This is the location map and the aerial. The applicant proposes to subdivide 1.35 acres for one commercial lot. The existing building will remain. Primary access to the subdivision is proposed from Mesa Street, and the development was reviewed under the current subdivision code. This is Coronado High School. 
and the location map, the aerial, The applicant was, uh, as part of the uh, bond proposal approved by voters, the El Paso Independent School District proposes to demolish several existing buildings and replace them with new buildings on the Coronado High School campus. Since EPISD proposes to construct additional buildings, the square footage of which will result in more than 50% of the total existing square footage, the applicant must plat the property Specifically, the applicant proposes to combine several tracks of record into one parcel totaling approximately 43 acres. The applicant also proposes to dedicate three feet of additional right-of-way to Champions Place in order to conform to the DSC standards, an additional right-of-way of vari variable width along a portion of Cloudview Drive in order to include the sidewalk within the right-of-way Access to the proposed subdivision is provided via Mesa Street and Champions Place, and the case was reviewed under the current subdivision code. Now, the CPC did recommend approval of Coronado High School with conditions. Mm -hmm. Those conditions, the first one, that prior to recordation of the plat, the applicant dedicate the undedicated portion of Cloudview Drive by separate instrument. Mm -hmm and that the applicant improves their proportionate share of said portion of Cloudview Drive in accordance with the DSC standard for a residential collector right-of-way through their building permit. This is Montesillo Union 11 and its location map, the aerial map. The applicant proposes to subdivide approximately 60 acres of land for a smart code development including mixed-use lots and two private civic spaces. The applicant is proposing a private street within this development. Primary access to the subdivision is proposed from Suncrest Drive and Montesillo Boulevard. The application is being reviewed under Title 21 and is required to comply with the approved Montesillo regulating plan. Okay. This one was also approved by the CPC with three conditions. Uh, the first one, that the applicant must address all pending drainage issues in accordance with Title 19, and the drainage design manual and all necessary plat revisions be completed before submittal of the Mylar prior to recording the final plat. Second one, that the applicant file a temporary turnaround document for Vin Rambla in order to meet Section 1915-100 and reference that document on the plat prior to recording of the final plat and that prior to the recording of the final plat, that Montesillo Unit 11 file restrictive covenants pursuant to section 1915-150 of the El Paso City Code. The next subdivision is ROP office, the location map, and the area. On this one, the applicant uh, proposes to subdivide three acres of land for a commercial site. The property is currently in track form and access to the subdivision is from Mesa, North Mesa Street and Double Tree Drive. The CPC recommended approval with the condition that the applicant submit proof that the existing 250 foot EP easement uh, recorded in the County of El Paso be vacated prior to plat recording. This is CMC Commercial Replat A and the aerial map. The applicant proposes to re-subdivide approximately 48 acres of land. The proposed development is for the construction of a fire site on a 1.468 acre lot, an existing private stormwater pond, and an existing hospital site. Access to the subdivision is from Trans Mountain and Resler. Excuse me, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ortiz, is CMC the uh, hospital? Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is uh, the aerial. You can see the hospital. Right, there. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Now, again, they were proposing uh, the hospital, replatting the hospital lot, which is that one there. Okay. They were uh, proposing to construct a fire station right around that area. Okay. And 
this is a pond, drainage pond. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, again, the applicant proposes the following to dedicate the existing private stormwater pond along the drainage and access easements and other associated drainage infrastructure, to dedicate a 10 foot utility easement along Resler, to vacate an existing 10 foot utility easement located along the western boundary of the subdivision. Mm -hmm. And I can go in further detail if necessary uh, after the presentation if Thank you guys you. have any questions about that. Thank you. The next one is Desert Springs Unit 5. This is the location map and it's aerial. The applicant proposes to subdivide approximately 10 and a half acres of vacant land for 48 single family residential lots mm -hmm. and a common open space which is proposed to be privately maintained. Primary access to the subdivision is proposed from Resler Drive. The applicant is proposing private streets to service the subdivision, and the subdivision is or was reviewed under the current subdivision code. And with that, that will conclude my presentation. Those were the seven subdivisions, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you all may have regarding the uh, the presentation. Are there any questions? I only have one question, and it may not be within the purview of this board, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and I can be corrected if needed. Um, on the last Desert Springs Unit 5, I thought they had to have an, an, an entrance and an, an egress and an exit on these plots. What, I don't understand. I see a big square there and only one in and out. Sure. Uh, so I don't me, understand it. Sure. So let me explain. So this right here is the extension of Resler Drive. Right. Okay. So they, through the subdivision, the developer is proposing to complete that extension. Additionally, what's in blue are proposed right-of-ways. So their ingress and egress is that there. It's the same. It's the same same road. No, so that's Resler. Uh -huh. right? This one is their ingress and egress uh, okay. into the subdivision. This one here. Okay. And it's a separate road. There's a it's a T intersection. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Ortiz. Thank you. Uh, item number four, progress on mountain to river trail system. And I understand Mr. Castillo is here and as is uh, Mr. Novak. We look forward to this presentation. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon, uh, uh, OSAP board members and Madam Chair. And, and uh, my name is Tracy Novak. I'm the Parks and Recreation Director. I'm happy to be here today to give you an update on the Mountain to River Trail. I know this has been an item of interest for your board for some time. And uh, what we have here is a, a little bit of a summary of uh, our efforts to date. We actually have been working on this project for a while. And um, actually, the genesis of which uh, uh, has been in place for many years. And we've been uh, in close uh, coordination with uh, interested folks from the community, including the uh, Border, Borderland uh, Mountain Bike Association. Um, and uh, uh, we've had a number of different council actions along the way that have also have assisted us and given us direction up to this point. So where we are now is that we are uh, working on the phase one um, elements uh, to make this rip Mountain to River Trail a reality.
Um, was there a handout provided? Okay, there it is. Now you can see up on the screen. And um, so I'll refer to that and indicate that the phase one timeline uh, will, uh, that we're in right now is uh, the preparation of the scope of work uh, with the community, uh, community uh, improvement department. Excuse uh, me, Mr. Novak, and I hate to be rude, but uh, I don't think that the board can read that. Be, is uh, there some way that someone can go run a copy of that so that the, our board members can have that? You, oh, you can read it. Well, I can't read it from the distance. And I guess if you can. OK, my mistake. Thank you. I have a copy of it. I just want to be sure everybody else does. You would like to have a copy of it. I'll share. Thank you very much, Mr. Novak. I do apologize. No problem. Okay, so uh, the uh, we're working on the scope of work uh, for to bring in a uh, uh, consultant to assist the city in the design and construction of the of the trail. Uh, we're in the middle of doing that right now, and that's getting refined. We expect to go to council. Um, to have that uh, brought before them um, in February. And then we'll begin the uh, advertising and response, the, the qualifications-based uh, process to select someone. Um, that will conclude, we're anticipating, by May of this year. And then, um, following that, we're gonna be working on easements and agreements we anticipate that that will take about nine months, uh, followed by design and construction uh, development. It would begin in, in May. And there are several sub-elements uh, that, of that effort that would be included, which includes uh, uh, initial coordination with stakeholders. And I know from prior um, OSAB uh, involvement, there's a significant interest in having a community stakeholder meeting and, and engaging the community in what we're trying to achieve with the Mountain to, to River Trail. Uh, initially, we're gonna have an initial coordination meeting with just uh, the major landowners that we're gonna be working with, uh, some of which have uh, indicated here. Pri there are some private owners, uh, El Paso Water Utilities, State Parks, uh, um, TxDOT, uh, and perhaps others. We're also gonna look for an archeological study uh, and, uh, and then refine the trail alignment. There has been a trail alignment. There's been a lot of input into it. There is opportunities to, to still at this point to align so that we can satisfy property owner interests that we have to work with. And uh, it's the appropriate time when you can literally move a line on a map and it doesn't really cost a lot compared to trying to uh, in, um, construct something um, and then perhaps have a change order that, that could, uh, could, could prove costly, so, or might not even be allowed. So uh, all that trail alignment effort will be working on that, and then moving on to the official community stakeholder presentation where we'll engage the community, show them that proposed trail alignment, take input, make modifications, and then refine it so that we can move on to the next stage, which uh, we're anticipating would be construction uh, of beginning construction of the trail as early as winter of uh, 2018. So that's our process that we uh, have identified for you. And uh, Parks and Recreation working with CID, uh, we're um, a powerful team. We're accomplishing all kinds of things in the city right now. And we're anticipating we're gonna be able to do that with the Mountain to River Trail. I'm open for any questions that you may have. I'm sorry, but I don't, under, I don't understand what SOW is. Uh, scope of work. Thank you. That's yeah, a shorthand. I'm Thank sorry. You. We all have our little shorthands in the different or, uh, areas of expertise, so scope yeah. of work. Very good. Thank yeah, you. What that is, just to uh, kind of re refer to that again, is that uh, when you put something out for a consultant to uh, 
respond to. It's a qualifications-based process. They have to submit the, their proposal to the city. That proposal is based on the scope of work that you put out. So we have to be as thorough as we can to make sure that we're, we have everything covered that we want to have in this trail. Um, some of our discussions have been is that it could be a very expensive trail if we touched every part of it because it's, uh, it's going to be several miles long. There, we believe there's uh, quite a bit of the trail that doesn't need to have a lot of treatment to it. And so we want to be uh, within the uh, scope to find that so that the proposers know that we're not looking for a, an asphalt trail for uh, up through the mountains. We're looking to try and make use of this as a natural surface trail primarily and connect to existing hard uh, scape trail elements that are already in place, as you know, along Trans Mountain. So uh, a scope of work is very important. And that would include areas all the way down to the river yes. and crossing that wonderful area that we've talked about, putting a bridge in or a, a um, what is it, a swinging bridge of some sort? Well, we'll certainly take a look at it. And we'll, All right. Yes. Because that would be uh, certainly um, an interest, an area of interest for many people in the Southwest. Quite unusual. Yes. <laughs> Any questions or comments from our board? Thank you very much, Mr. Novak. Oh, excuse me. The um, we have one question or comment from our uh, from the uh, audience. Thank you, Madam Chair. When I heard this discussion, it, it kicked off a thought because. Um, Excuse me, Marilyn, would you Marilyn give your Guida, name? Sorry, <laughs> Marilyn Guida, sorry, Marilyn Guida. We had Lauren Baldwin from CID Department recently, and so maybe this is a good time to say, you know, is there a potential for any rainwater harvesting, stormwater harvesting kinds of features to be added to this trail since it is uh, along the mountainside and we know the level of rain issues that we have in El Paso. So that's like a, a hope and a prayer for, for me to put out that it would be nice to have that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what, the, the way I'll comment to that is that we're, in, in this trail construction, our desire is for it to be a, a maintainable type of trail, one that um, hopefully we won't have to do a lot to because we're gonna work with the land rather than perhaps against it. And by that, I'm saying that the trail alignment is going to, we're going to try and, and we're going to use a professional trail builder uh, and a design that's certified as a, as a, for that type of um, trail that works with the land, that uh, uses uh, trail technology that uh, goes with the water flow rather than against it. Um, rainwater harvesting was mentioned. So, you know, our intent is that when water comes across the pathway, uh, it will be constructed in such a way as to minimize damage as much as possible, but also continue to flow uh, down its natural pathway. And we believe if we follow those kinds of principles, which are well documented within that, that uh, type of design, um, it will benefit the city because we won't be spending a lot of money out there trying to repair trail all the time, but we'll also uh, maintain the balance of nature by allowing water to flow through where uh, nature has um, um, intended it to go. So we're going to, you know, wherever that water comes across, we're not going to try and manipulate it. We're going to try and allow it to just work with the, uh, with the trail itself. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much, Mr. Novak. You're welcome. Okay. <coughs> Item number five. Mr. Castillo, update on the status of uh, construction of four trailheads. Am I correct? Is that what we're looking at now? Yes. All righty. presentation to load.
Good afternoon, Jorge Castillo, uh, Parks and Recreation. Presentation on the update on the uh, trailhead projects. The trailhead locations are, are displayed in this map. Two are in District 4, uh, Roundhouse and Lazy Cow, which is slightly north of uh, Chuck Heinrich Park. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, one in, on Thunderbird, kind of across from the Thunderbird Country Club, mm -hmm. and then one at Thousand Steps, which is the end of stint. We'll go through uh, four items. We'll cover the first two, basically the milestones that occurred in 2017. A series of community meetings were held. Uh, the design was completed for the four trailheads. Again, Lazy Cow, Roundhouse, Thousand Steps, and Thunderbird. And the basic amenities of the trailheads includes uh, a combination of gravel parking areas, uh, concrete accessible parking areas, and some very, very basic uh, amenities. Uh, these do include uh, uh, drinking, found, drinking fountains and uh, uh, bicycle racks and bicycle repair station. And uh, the drinking fountains also include options for, uh, for, for pets, a pet drinking fountain as well. The procurement process was initiated after the design was completed, uh, meaning that the construction documents were, were finalized and this project went to bid in November. Uh, bids were received in December. And uh, as I mentioned before at several presentations, uh, like most departments, we work in conjunction with the Capital Improvement Department, which actually handles the, the, uh, the procurement. They, they work with the procurement office. But they handle the, the construction management of, of these jobs. And uh, the bids were received and they were rejected and because the cost came in uh, much higher than anticipated, uh, at, at a point almost 30% higher. So they will repackage the bid and they will, uh, the projects will be rebid uh, next month. Uh, we had also hoped to have, to have with us today the project manager from Capital Improvement Department, uh, Rick Venegas, who uh, notified us re uh, a, a couple of, uh, earlier today that he could not make today's meeting. So we would like to uh, schedule him for a more detailed meeting, uh, I mean, detailed okay. presentation in February so he could answer some of your questions. Uh, and basically with that, I will, we're, we, we were hopeful that the construction would have, uh, would have taken place in 2017. Uh, with the new schedule, the, as far as I know it, uh, the bids will be advertised in February. Uh, the bids will be uh, taken to council for awarding in early summer. Construction will begin uh, in, uh, shortly after and the anticipated construction uh, time is uh, uh, late summer, fall of 2018. Would you go, go back over that because I want to write it down? Sure. So it's basically advertising for bids in February. In February. Uh, early, early summer, right before summer, uh, it would go to city council for award. Uh, construction okay. date in uh, early summer and then completion in uh, late, uh, late summer, uh, early fall. That's assumed that they're responsive bids. That, uh, correct. And, and as I mentioned, uh, we, we are inviting uh, the project manager from Capital Improvement Department to make a, a more detailed presentation on the construction aspect and bidding procurement uh, process at the next uh, OSAP meeting in Febu February. Thank you very much. I do appreciate that. Um, this has been a long time coming, as we've all discussed, and uh, I'm really pleased to see it's moving forward and that we can hopefully have something accomplished on the ground by the end of this year. And we're, we're, we're as hopeful as well. Well, okay. Any questions from the board? Yeah, you said it was 30% over what they expected? Mm -hmm. Does that mean, that, I assume that means the project's going to be scaled back from what was? Yes. 
Uh, there, there are a lot of dynamics, actually, uh, according to Capital Improvement uh, Department. Uh, when there's a lot of uh, construction activity in the, in, it's kind of a combination of items. When there's a lot of construction activity in the region, uh, bids ha have a tendency to come in higher as well. And so uh, they're going to look at, at more uh, like line items when those, when those other uh, uh, bids come in. And, and they, they feel that maybe they can add some more clarity to the, to the bid package and hopefully get the uh, actual cost that they were hoping for. So it would not necessarily be cut back then? No. Is this bond money? Yes. Yes. It's then, bond you know, money. we see these other projects come up the, uh, what is it, Mexican, I mean, the cultural center. The council's willing to put in 10 more million for that. They were originally. We got the children's museum. Now they're asking for more money for that. I mean, why not? Th this is kind of a, uh, like Judy Ackerman said, that, you know, the open space and such things seem to be in the back of the council's mind. You know, I don't know how much money more money we're talking about, but why couldn't a proposal be made that they allocate more money if this fails in, you know, February, or whatever, well, that, rather that, than to cut the project back? Sure. Uh, well, that's something that would have to be uh, uh, evaluated once, once, the, once the, uh, the, the next round of bids yeah. comes in. We will certainly that's a take that into consideration. To go to, you could go to council and ask for more money. Right, I mean, or somebody could. That's an that that's an option. Uh, you know what we at the same time we also hear from other uh, community members that we want to be able to keep the costs for projects like trailheads rather low, so we can we uh, uh, so they can be uh, economical, and we and we actually have a very um, kind of streamlined. Uh, uh, construction budgets uh, going forward because it's basically a very very basic uh, amenities for, for for a trailhead and then it actually helps to uh, keep in uh, context with uh, a, a natural setting in, in, in other words if we add too much if we add too much uh, um, to the to the uh, project then uh, it, it, it may take away from the natural setting but we will we we will revisit that once the new uh, the next round of bids comes in. Yeah, I'm not saying add to. I'm just saying keep the project as originally proposed. That's what I'm saying. Sure, and it's, and it's something we, we we can look at when the when the when when the bids are received. Matter of curiosity, what was your um, upper cost cutoff? Uh, that I can't answer. The the, uh, the one one came in at uh, the 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 general budget for this. Project was at for the four uh, trailheads was uh, five hundred twenty-five five hundred thousand, uh -huh. and the uh, top one came in uh, about around eight hundred thousand mm dollars. -hmm. We're not talking about uh, penny ante stuff either, but uh, exactly not chump change. <laughs> what was the low bid? Do you recall? Uh, I believe it was around uh, six hundred thousand dollars, but that bid was uh, had some issues with it it wasn't it wasn't a complete it wasn't a complete uh, bid package okay okay but 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 again I, I I just have basic information on that part of the process uh, I would um, ask that you consider um, uh, accepting the invitation from capital improvements to have someone from capital improvements make a presentation at the February board meeting well they're always invited <laughs> Yeah, we need the information, and we do appreciate it. So we're looking forward to uh, Mr. Venegas coming in next month. I, I really hope that um, we're able to keep the momentum up on getting the OSAB concerns moving forward. As we all know, they've been on the books for a long time. Are there any other questions or comments from the board? Uh, what was the cost you were looking for? It was around uh, five hundred thousand dollars. A hundred, around r roughly one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars per trail hit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any comments from the audience? Yes. Marilyn Guida, again, you know, I haven't visited any of our current trailheads, and I don't think I remember seeing any 
any detailed plans uh, or hearing about any um, at OSAB meetings. So I'm wondering if there's any plans for pervious uh, paving for the parking areas, um, you know, and it, again, features that um, would uh, help us more naturally deal with stormwater and, and uh, rainwater uh, issues. And I, and I appreciate Mr. Novak's comments very much on, on my last comment. Thank you. Thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, and, if, and I'll encourage those of you that have not been to uh, uh, Lost Dog uh, Trailhead to actually visit that, and that, that, that kind of set the standard for the designs that you will see. Uh, it's basically the parking area is basically gravel, and uh, for the majority of the parking spaces, one one of the parking areas is actually um, uh, uh, concrete, and that's for the accessible parking area. So we do try to incorporate those kinds of features in, in, in this design. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Castillo. Okay, <coughs> are you up again? No. No, you're not. Madam Chair. Can yes, I ask um, IT, we had an auto, an auto uh, restart for our two computers. We just need to be logged on, please. IT? You can just press the next button here and we'll come. Oh, magic. Okay, thank you. There's a, they Which, should be coming. That that she just for future said that Oh, you do. We don't have it. Okay, button. thank you. The magic tech button. Is that correct? I do, it's, it's, oh, there it is. Okay, it was shut off. Got it, thank you. Thank you. Oh. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay. It was an item number six, restart, yeah. update Global. on the status of the El Paso water purchase on the Hunter Royos. Is that correct? Hi. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Patricia Dalvin, No Paso Water Utilities. At mm -hmm. this time, there's no update on the designs. Uh, okay. We have not received anything to date. We hope to have them at least by the next quarterly meeting. Okay. okay. Thank you. Next. And you also have the next one, Ms. Dalvin, am I correct? All right. Good afternoon, board. Uh, this is Martin Noriega. I am the Stormwater Operations and Fleet Maintenance Division Manager. I am here to give a presentation that Dr. Bonar uh, had seen uh, when I presented to the TFMA, which is the Texas Floodplain Managers yes. Association. And it's basically our overview of stormwater operations, what we do out there, what we have, uh, how we maintain it. Uh, so it's just a quick preview. So um, thank you very much for uh, inviting Reaching me over. Out. Mm -hmm. Uh, just real quick uh, on the first slide, as you see, uh, it's just showing you the city, how we have it broken down on all our different uh, areas. We've got four different areas where we have satellite offices out there, and those areas maintain the storm system that's in that area. Uh, for most part, uh, if you look at the green, the orange, and the blue area, you've got like about nine individuals that maintain that area and whatever uh, stormwater assets we have. And in the pink area, we've got more of the central. We have a bigger operation there just due to the fact that we have the vector operators out there and uh, how we maintain throughout the city. Uh, for most part, this is our responsibility. Uh, you're looking at dams, pump stations, the ponds, uh, channels, agricultural drains throughout the city. You've got storm conduits. Uh, for most part, a lot of these numbers are constantly increasing because of new development. Coming in, we end up uh, incurring the new ponding areas that we have to maintain as well as uh, a lot of the drop inlets that you see throughout the city. Uh, real quick, uh, throughout this presentation, I'm gonna pretty much have a lot of pictures, so I'll go through them pretty quick. But we've got the vectors, this is basically what it is, and it kinda uh, extracts water when we have low-lying areas that we can help street department as well as us or whoever else with Pleasure. tech stop. We always kind of uh, work together with them. We try and keep uh, a good close relationship with them. Uh, these vector trucks also pull a lot of uh, sediment and debris out of the inlets and conduits and stuff because you may end up having a lot of the sand, the dirt that kind of filters off the mountain and anything that just washes into them. 
uh, here, like I said, uh, it's an inlet. Basically, some of it is done through the vac, just some of it is done by hand, but it just uh, sometimes collections, you know, the first flush that you get, you get a lot of this debris that's going in there. Ponding areas, uh, for most part, are big, I guess issues or concerns it's always weeds we always get a lot of calls on that it's always that type of vegetation that we need to clean up so that way it doesn't uh, start breeding mosquitoes uh, start kind of creating a, a what do you call it like a trash collector in a sense with the weeds so we try and maintain them and it depends on the area also and especially talking here with OSAP, we look at a lot of the areas and if you've got some type of wildlife and stuff we try and maintain we work with uh, a lot of the people that are out there the environmentalists that kind of give us a, how do you want to put guidance on that? And especially on the west side, we do that. So a lot of it is, it helps us out to have this vegetation because it reduces the type of erosion that we get. So that way we're not having to go back every year fixing it, so it kind of helps us out. Here, uh, the dams, uh, we always have to maintain them. Uh, every year we have the Army Corps inspections uh, to inspect a lot of these dams that we have uh, throughout the city uh, that way we can still stay in good standards with them with the program that they have because uh, a lot of the structures that they have depending on what happens what type of rainfall we get uh, if something gets kind of destroyed and if we've been maintaining it they come back and fix it they'll help us out they'll get a new design they'll work with us and it's happened and uh, at least uh, six seven years that I've been working at stormwater I've seen it once that we've had something kind of really uh, topple over and we had to fix it and it was more of a channel type so they come in and they they uh, maintain it and it's it's coming out of their budget so you know that's how we end up maintaining this it, it helps us out a lot in the future channel cleaning like I said a uh, lot of channels agriculturals well we'll clean them down because they're they're basically uh, they hold water and stuff you start having that uh, that mosquito issue that's really a lot of the calls that we get we also have the capabilities to pump water out. We have a lot of uh, major pumps that are portable. Uh, you're talking from like six, eight, 10, 12 inch pumps that we can move around and uh, move water around if we need to, or uh, just uh, empty out a ponding area because depending on the size of it or what we need to do in that regards. And also our services uh, range also to sandbag distribution, which is uh, a lot of the people, we have uh, five sites that are out there that people can go and collect uh, sandbags. Uh, throughout the year, uh, it's usually the Fred Wilson uh, area that's open all year round. The rest of them are usually done through the monsoon season, which is give or take June, end of June, July, all the way to the end of September that we have all sites open. And these are just showing you some areas in some amount that's by Ponder Park area, you know, you get a good flush, you get a good nice little rain, a lot of it kind of plugs up and then we're getting the calls and we're out there fix, uh, cleaning them up and fixing them. You've got high ridge, we had a lot of debris come in, we had to clean it out, maintain it. Uh, and this right here is just basically explaining work orders. Work orders for us is something that we generate, we go through like a process trying to be a proactive in the regards that we already know our main areas that we need to maintain clean or what we've identified. So we try and get to them before they become a service request, which is what uh, the public calls us in on and what we have to take care of, which is here the service request and what they deal with. These pie charts, it just basically states whether it was water extraction, whether it was just uh, debris, weed controls or something to that effect or something a little bit major. And this basically shows you the service request throughout the city where we get the calls, what's going on so we have a history behind it so that way we can know where a lot of our problem areas are so then that way we can kind of we start trying to be proactive more than reactive but nonetheless with a storm you always have to be reactive because you never know what type of storm you're going to get and what kind of uh, issues are going to come about and talking about the mosquitoes and the water uh, when they started having all about the Zika virus and stuff so we ended up kind of trying to be proactive in that regards and we started trying to do this, trying to do something with our ponding areas that held water a little longer than what they needed to. So we started using either like HTH to kind of disinfect the water so that way the mosquitoes couldn't breed. We used that mosquito fish, 
especially when we like in the Shaw land area, the ponding areas there, uh, we would put the fish in there so that way it helps because they basically like to eat the mosquitoes, the eggs and all. So we're trying to do some type of preventive measure as well as the larvicide, you know, once you have it kind of working with uh, vector control in that regards, uh, they have access to a lot of our ponding area so they can fog, but we're trying to, to help them out in that regards to try and minimize what we have going on. And the other one is gypsum. And in this one, I'm gonna talk probably a little bit more about it later, but this is just kind of showing you what the HTH is. It's basically uh, your hypochlorite type uh, chlorine that you use in pools, that you would throw out in pools to, you know, shock in. These are the mosquito fish that we have. There's just a picture of them. And we purchase so many and we put them in a lot of these ponding areas that we constantly have water because of the water table being so high so it never drains. And then these are the briquettes that they use out there and they basically throw them out there in the water and it kind of uh, does its magic in a sense of preventing uh, mosquitoes to lay their eggs. It'll kill them. And these are some of the ponding areas that the guys were putting them out in there. And then gypsum. Gypsum is something that we started using on some of our ponding areas that basically, you know, there's no wildlife or anything like that. We started using gypsum at the bottom and stuff to help it percolate. So what this, the way we were looking at it was, one, it's helping us to recharge the aquifer with the water that we have coming from stormwater. So we're trying to do our part through the water utilities in the sense of how can we get, you know, instead of this water just evaporating and going up, into the air, we wanted to try and see how we can uh, manage that and how we can help ourselves. So basically, we started using gypsum. We started uh, Eastwood Dam was one of them and the Saipan. As you can see on the time frames, the elapse, 2-9, we ended up having that much water. It would percolate very slowly. Uh, within a couple of months, it dried up, so obviously it was helping us out. So we started researching and looking into it. So we got with UTEP. Uh, we ended up having the students there, graduate students, doing a test and they started, ended up uh, doing control tests with the gypsum, with the soils that we would get out of some of the ponds. And they started doing some testing to see how much should we use, does it, is it even working, or is there something else out there that could work. Uh, bottom line, what came out, we were trying it out there at the Spaghetti Bowl. That area was a good place, uh, has a lot of clay. Uh, the water sits around in that area. And so they started doing the testing. And bottom line, what we ended up coming out was the optimum gypsum content was 17.3 tons per acre that we could use out there and causes a good infiltration going through there even though you have a clay layer. So that was a benefit. So that's what we're looking at. Now we're still working right now with UTEP, doing a second uh, program in a sense of how often should we be applying it. So that way we can make the most of our money when we're, when we're putting it out there and trying to get that, uh, one, you have less calls maybe on mosquitoes, you recharge the aquifer a little bit better with the ponding areas that we got. I mean, we're close to about 400 ponds and if you think of half of those maybe holding water, we can have that percolate down into our aquifer. Uh, what they've also shown is it's not harmful. A lot of the gypsum that they've, they've been using it for many, many years with farmland in a sense of getting that salt content out because that's what holds it back. So it was, uh, a pretty much win-win situation for us. And that kind of concludes my, my presentation, but we always end up with the turn around, don't drown, because around here, you know, you get those flash floods and you're in a low-lying area and you just gotta be careful. But if there are any questions. The uh, ponding area by the spaghetti bowl. Yes, sir. I live close to there. Before they did that area in Saipan, I guess it was, you know, they, yes, the one yeah. uh, the south of the freeway. Yeah, but the uh, north of the freeway, yes. right, basically right under there. That water used to drain out a lot quicker. Did you guys raise the drainage there? I mean, because it, it'll stay there for a long time, even when there's no rain. You know what, I mean, with that one, the thing is, it's TxDOT property, so they helped us do this, you know, project, you know, in a sense with the gypsum. So it, I don't know, I, I don't know if it needs to maybe be uh, desilted or it needs to be worked, but I know that they've been constantly doing that work and beautification around there. So I'd have to get with TxDOT to find out about that one because that's, that, they're the ones that own that one. We don't maintain it, we don't do that. We do the upper portion of it, but that's about it. So I've been uh, fortunate to 
get with some other guys from Texas and they've been very open and helping us out as well as us helping them. So I could definitely find out what, what the reason is or if they're going to end up, and there's what a, their desilting process is. There's a lot of vegetation in it most of the time. Yeah. You said you take that out. I don't know when that thing's been cleaned. And well, like I say, I have to years. get with text that because that's theirs. Okay. So I know, uh, like I said, going back to the presentation is with each area, you've got like about nine individuals, but you've got so many assets that we have to maintain it's almost impossible to get to each one every year. So it's kind of like what helps us out is the public telling us, hey, you know what? This is dirty. This needs to be clean. We'll put it on the list. We'll kind of put it as a priority. But some of them, we already know that there's those issues and we've got their, you know, the area that it's located in. And like the one that you're mentioning, it's, it's easy for us to now start talking with other agencies to work with that. And so it, it gives us that, hey, you know what? We've got the calls from here. They're concerned about it. And we can always work with them. I uh, says so that's something that we've always kind of uh, gotten with a lot of these agencies that we're willing to help them out even though it's not our per se asset, but it means that we're helping our community. And so it's, it's just really having that coordination with them and getting with them. Thank you. Any other questions from the board or comments from the board? Just from a comment. Yes. Please. Um, thank you, Martin. That was a great presentation. You're and welcome. I didn't know that y'all were utilizing um, the UTEP students, grad students. So what a good idea and uh, with some good outcomes. So thank no. you for that. Thank you so Very much. Very informative. Appreciate it. Yeah. Very informative. Uh, from the audience. Judy Ackerman for the record. Uh, Mr. Martina. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I appreciate knowing about the mosquito fish and the gypsum, and uh, I, I second the idea of working with uh, UTEP and utilizing all your resources. Really great. Uh, I'm wondering. I have a, do have a question, and I'm wondering if you can bring up the picture of the what did you call it? Uh, pond cleaning. You do it really quick. One more. The pond. Yeah. Yep. There. Perfect. They can't, oh, now they can see it. Way, yeah. way cool. Uh, recently, the OSAB had a presentation from Lauren Baldwin about utilizing stormwater to grow plants. What a concept. And, uh, <clears throat> and how beautiful. She had some wonderful examples. And it's just as far as aesthetics, I much prefer the one on the left where you see some native uh, um, sunflowers and other yes. nice things blooming. So uh, personally, the one on the right looks ugly. So uh, I'm wondering if uh, you can't also utilize stormwater in the manner that Lauren Baldwin was talking about, uh, right in that particular, right there on that pond, as opposed to making it uh, barren. No, <laughs> can you do that? You know, to answer that question is yes. I mean, for us, the hard part is we're stuck in the middle. <laughs> you got some people that want it to look like the right-hand side. You got the other people that want it to look like the left-hand side. So it's a compromise between both. So it's kind of, you know, I guess answering the question is, it's really trying to see what would be best because I would rather have them on the slopes so that way it minimizes our erosion and it's less work because at the bottom it's not a problem because we're gonna have to desilt it anyway. You know, in, in that regard. So that's going to end up getting uh, hauled out or cleaned up and stuff. But that is something that we've been looking at. We've, we've actually looked at the possibility of like lantanas and mm -hmm. stuff and having them grow around mm -hmm. and stuff. But the thing is, it's just doing it, getting it, you know, setting up so many of them and then watering them and having them take because we like that root system. Mm -hmm. And it, it'll, it reduces the maintenance that we have to do. Mm -hmm. You know, if we look at some of the areas and stuff, because sometimes a lot of the, the issues that we have, it's they're concentrated in one particular area. It's not the whole pond. You know, it's just certain areas. And if we can do something that's greener, uh, you know, and I didn't even mention a, a lot of the stuff that we do is we try and recycle. So we ended up getting a couple of wood chippers. So when we're taking stuff out, we'll mm. chip it and we'll utilize it if we can. But if not, it's less that we have to take out to the landfill. So we try and reduce our costs a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, you name it, we're always looking at a lot of things, even with projects that I know they're talking about, um, you know, our stormwater projects. We'll look and see what they're uh, hauling out. And the thing is, we like to use that material for that instead of having it taken out to a landfill where it's just 
you know, you're just filling that up with just dirt and rock, and we prefer it. So we try and utilize it anywhere we can. So we're always looking at a lot of ideas. So by all means, share them with us. Madam Chairman. Yes, please. Couldn't that be mowed? Does it have to be scraped? Well, we do mow it. That is with a weed eater and a mower that we do that with. Well, yes, so, but the picture on the right here, has it's been scraped. There's nothing left. That's yes. fair. If it had been mowed, you know, they do this in Arizona, and, and eventually you get grass. Yeah. You know, the, the weeds disappear, the tumbleweeds disappear, and you get grass. Yeah. And, and the thing is, we're going to have to figure something out, but I know that particular area and where it's at, and the gentleman that likes it like that, that's, that, those are the hard parts that we have to deal with, because he well, lives there, but that's he's, what he's, because we'll he's, mow it and leave it. Maybe he's never seen it mowed and seen it, I'm sure he would prefer grass if he could see that. Oh, if we but, could. But, you know, he's probably never seen it mowed. <laughs> No, he's, he's a, a big advocate for a lot of things, and he'll let us know. So, <laughs> Mr. Noriega, um, there seem to be a lot of good ideas that come up, just several today. How do those ideas get to your department, to you? You um, know, through customer service calling us. Um, what's you know, a good telephone number? You know, usually it's our 5500 number that you call customer okay. service. That way they, they send it over to, uh, you know, customer service is good about if you mention Stormwater, they'll send us the email or the or whoever it was that called and we try and call back. I mean, we're we try and be good about it and stuff and we look at the ideas. Then after that, it's just really a lot of the forums like this, you know, bringing up the ideas, then just just looking into it, doing research really is finding out because Sometimes we're not the experts, but whoever's bringing that idea might be, and we have to pick their brains to see what's what's good. Because we've had some people come about rain gardens, you know, and some of the sure. easements and stuff like that, and we have no problems. It's just that we don't have maybe the capabilities to do that, but it would have to be that that local community to do it if they wanted to. But the thing is, we can always go over to like land management, see what we can and sure. can't do and stuff, and that's really it. Is there an email address that, um, that would be preferable? Uh, I'm trying to think, because I thought there was like a stormwater operations email, but let me, I'll get with Patricia and we'll look and see what the, what an email that we have that would go towards our guys, because I think uh, there's yeah, one that, that goes to like code compliance and one to us. Right, sometimes telephone calls get hung up on or uh, put on hold for extraordinary well, amounts and, of time. And they get rerouted to the wrong person because it just depends on the dialogue that you use and what cold words that you say. Sure. And it might get sent to somebody else depending on what they're trying to talk about. Okay. But, but by all means, uh, if anything, uh, I'll bring some cards. It's just that we had some training and I ended up getting rid of all my cards. But I will bring some to you all. I'll give them to Patricia to when they come to the next meeting. And then okay. that way you kind of have at least a point of contact. So we can do a follow-up with uh, how to connect with your department. Definitely. Okay. Thank you very much. No, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Okay, moving on to number nine. Mr. Howell? Nine. You really arranged it. Number eight oh, was deleted. Number eight was uh, moved, postponed until postponed. February. Okay, I'm assuming that happened because I was late, and I apologize for that. Yeah, you didn't that. Text message. <laughs> you didn't get the memo, sorry. Yeah, why is it postponed? Uh, I refer to staff. Yeah, I, I can answer that. The reason why is, is because it did come in late, and we just needed additional time to figure out the appropriate person who can provide that information. Uh, I, that was one of the first ones I sent you. So maybe they just need more time than a month. Right, just to be able to, to get prepare. That. Right, and then with the holidays and everything, that's why we needed that additional time. Well, we do look forward to hearing from them on in February. Madam Chairman. Yes. I was informed last night that they are considering action in the immediate future on this property. So postponing it till February may not be an ideal solution for us. Uh, Madam Chair, please. If I could just 
kind of add to the discussion, we did contact um, Ellen Smythe, who's the Director of Environmental Services, to ask for her recollection of this item. And what had happened, she gave us a brief description of what happened when the memo originally went to City Council. But according to Ellen, it's not, there's nothing imminent occurring with this. Uh, it, it, it seems like we've got a conflict of information here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very uncomfortable with this. And I, sh the I think you are the, also. The, the person at the city who is in charge of selling real estate, you. And he's here. Yes. yes. Good deal. Then we can get some information on this from you, maybe? So we proposed something to Mr. Bernie Sargent that he was to take to the board. We have not heard He back. did. But we have not heard back. Well, I can tell you that he did last night, and it was yeah. not met favorably. Well, we have not heard back from him. Mm -hmm. So I cannot say if it went well or not because our point of contact has not been reached. Now, I don't doubt what you're saying, but going through the avenues where we negotiate with one person and then they hear back from wherever their, their board says and then come back to us, we have not heard anything. Madam Chairman, may I ask him a question? Certainly. So if the proposal, it, when Mr. Sargent gets back to you and says the proposal was not approved by the board, then will you proceed anyway? The proposal, well, to be honest, that project for the Municipal Service Center Excuse on that me, property, is this something that needs to be Madam, done in a closed Madam, session? Madam Chair? No, it's been five <laughs> years as a plan, and it's been five years as a master planned area. Okay. That is not a surprise, or that's not a a new thing that has occurred. Madam Chair. Okay. It was me. originally oh. part of the open space master plan that this was open space. Okay. Uh, I believe legal wants to okay. that, that give some was clarification possibly. Mm -hmm. Pursuant to the Open Meetings Act, at the beginning of the meeting, there was a, a request and an item placed on the agenda for changes to the agenda. And the board was informed at the time that that item would be postponed to the following I'm meeting. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. <clears throat> at the beginning of the meeting, the board was presented with changes to the agenda. And um, the, the executive secretary of the board, Mr. Howell, explained that the item would have to be postponed till the next meeting. The board then voted on those changes, and the agenda was changed to have that item postponed. There may have been people present at the beginning of the meeting that were here waiting to speak on that item and may have left. So they are not being given an opportunity to speak on this item now that it's been deleted. It would be inappropriate for me to allow you to continue to have this conversation when the board has voted to postpone the item till the following time. However, Ms. 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 Bird, I would recommend that if you have additional questions or comments that you can speak personally to Mr. Villalba about what you know, and then um, you can be prepared to speak about those items at the next meeting. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Can we move to put it back on the agenda? I'll try it. I so move to put item eight back on the agenda. I do have a question, and it refers to legal. Can we do that? Yes, you can move to put it back on the agenda. Um, I, I, the reason that I was discussing why we frown on that is because there may have been people that may have been present who were prepared to speak on that item and I don't know whether that could have happened and they may have left the meeting thinking that the item has now been postponed to the next meeting and will not be given an opportunity to speak or listen to the board about this item. However, if the board chooses to do so, you have every right to ask that the item be placed back on the agenda. Do I hear a motion by the board? That was me. Second. Okay. All in favor of putting item number eight back on the agenda for today, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? No. No. We have, it passes. The ayes carry. The ayes carry. So the item is back on the agenda per recommendation that as it as being appropriate by legal. Okay, it's back on the agenda.
So we're looking at item number eight. Okay, so where was I? Um, back. It's the update on the city concerning the, any plans regarding the property abutting Keystone Heritage Park. Update on the finding and altern, uh, update on finding an alternate location for the Citizen Collection Center and to preserve the city-owned property as natu national, natural open space in perpetuity. So that has never been the intention or the plan for Excuse that me. property. Those 27 acres that are next door to Keystone Heritage Park have always been and have continued to be planned as a municipal service center. That's it's been master planned. When it was acquired, that was the purpose for it. It was acquired using uh, enterprise fund money through environmental services. Enterprise fund money is very, um, how can I say, protected. And any money that is used for a specific purpose, if it does not get used for that specific purpose, must be paid back to the enterprise fund. Our, what we met with Mr. Sargent was to find a way to kind of extend an olive branch on how we could move forward and what our plans have been because we do understand that there has been some concern and some opposition in, in the placing of that municipal service center there. Uh, the plan with Mr. Sargent was we understand we did an archaeological study. Uh, we found that there was an archaeological site in connection to how the state asked us to move forward was we could either pave it over and make it a parking lot, we could leave it undisturbed, or we could fence it off, leave it undisturbed, or any combination of those. We plan to act according to what the state has recommended. Part of what I told Mr. Sargent was he has some plans for Keystone Heritage Park, which he needs some funding for. We said, we find that there is an opportunity to have a joint use of that uh, facility that he wishes to build on there and we could contribute certain funding towards that end. We would also contribute three acres, which would include the archeological site to create a buffer between Keystone Heritage Park and the Municipal Service Center. And we would also reroute the main street that would be the entrance to the Municipal Service Center to a street that's a little bit further away. He said he would take those things to his uh, board and we would hear back. We have not heard back from him. I understand that you may have had access to that meeting or not, but I haven't heard back from him. That was the proposal we gave, and that's the intention is to continue with it being a municipal service center. Now, we understand that there's opposition. We're trying to create all the branches to move forward. I don't see that there's any issue in regards to any of what we've done, and I think we're acting in a very amicable way. Um, Madam Chairman, Surely. this property prior to the city acquiring it, which they were anxious to have a trade for property downtown, which is the person who owned this property owned property downtown where the art space is. So that is why the city acquired this because the person who owned the art space property wanted to donate that okay. to the Community Foundation for the Art Space. So as part of, part of that trade, the city purchased this property. Prior to the city purchasing this property, it was part of the open space, the original open space master plan. It was designated as open space. Okay. Now, I have a small map here. I don't know if, if it could be projected or not. It was one that was given to Mr. Sargent last night. Well, one of the questions I would kind of look at, uh, and I could be terribly wrong, is since Texas is a uh, property right state, who does the property currently belong to? The city. the city of El Paso. So the city of El Paso has the say-so on how the land is to be used. Correct. And we have okay. not proceeded because we wish to have, obviously, a considerate way of acting. We, we understand and we hear people's concerns such as your own. But at the same time, the purpose of a municipal service center is to provide services for all citizens that live on the far west side of El Paso. And those 
if we don't use this site, we will have to acquire a different site, which will add another burden on the taxpayers for having to pay for said additional site. I would prefer not to spend millions of dollars trying to find a new location and use what we have and its designated purpose. Madam now, Chairman. we would, like I said, we've been trying to give olive branches. I think it's a good olive branch. Okay. And that's my Please, update. Go ahead. Could we show this map? Uh, this do we have legal, the technology I? to do that? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, just be, be Please. This was Could a we map just we don't have bring up the Elmo, please? Bring up, bring up the is, Elmo. Is the Elmo's not out. Oh, sorry, the Elmo's not out. Oh. Is there? The there, here there we, you go. Here we go. Thank you. If I'm I sorry, it's bring all that wrinkled. Up, it's been in my purse. I might need to warm up a little. Uh, excuse me. I think I did. What, what is the timetable that the city is using to make the decisions on this um, well, it's been master collection plan. center. It's been master planned for over five years. Obviously, um, it's not just going to be a collection center, though there's other uh, municipal service, um, no. I guess, no. things that will be there. There's been it's talk of a police it's station. There's been talk of mm -hmm. a fire station. Um, in the master plan, it shows adequate space for all those. So it's not just a collection station. It's a municipal service center. Um, if you see, well, may this I, doesn't, I, this I doesn't talk show. About this, please? I would like to talk about this map. Well, this map doesn't show the full 27 acres. I this, understand. This map shows Keystone Heritage Park. Right, I okay. understand. But maybe you brought a different one? No, I do not. Well, then this is the one we have to work with. Limitedly, yes, please go ahead. If you see the um, dirt space there on the right side, it's a square. And on the left side of that is all Keystone Park, goes all the way off the picture. Mm -hmm. But right next to that open dirt square that you can see there is the Botanical Garden. Mm -hmm. Now, I have never been to a city and I, I, when I travel, I do go to the botanical gardens, and I have never been to any city where they had a municipal service center, including garbage trucks, next to the botanical garden. Okay. Individuals have private people, not the city, have invested $1.2 million in that garden. If we detract from it with a commercial site there, it would be impossible for us to rent it out for weddings. That's the only mm -hmm. way we have of making money. The maintenance of the garden costs us $50,000 a year. We make slightly under that from renting it out for weddings and so on. Any kind of a distraction, it's hard enough to rent it as it is because uh, El Paso doesn't have nice weather 12 months out of the year. So it's hard enough to rent it as it is, but with, with a municipal, and, and we do, the, the service center right now is off the picture way to your way to your right we still get trash every single day we have trash that we have to pick up around our park it's mainly the plastic bags and other things that blow in from that recycle center so if it's moved closer uh, it that problem is just going to increase it's I would say I highly doubt that you can track where all these plastic bags are coming from, seeing as how El Paso is incredibly windy, and for you to have full certainty that the wind is blowing just right to blow it from where it currently is located to Keystone Heritage Park, which the city does own and leases to, uh, obviously. When we purchased the property, we had to guarantee the city that we would maintain it. If mm -hmm. the city would like it back, they can have it back. But we, we had to guarantee that we would maintain it because the city okay. had no money to develop it. Well, the, the city, city does like own to, it. To pay that $50,000 a year for the botanical garden and additional money for the wetland, well, we, we would appreciate that. So the city does own it. We do lease it for no cost. A dollar. A year. Exactly, no cost. Um, and we're acting as the intended purpose of it. Plus I have, excuse me, may I interrupt you? I, sure. I hate people that interrupt, but I'm going to. It's okay. Um, is there another meeting or another time when 
you can get together on putting this it sounds like you were left out of or the group I was they met with just was Mr. Left Sergeant, out. who's the chairman of the right. board and uh, you know there's a lot of input and we met last night following that meeting with uh, the El downtown El Paso Rotary who was uh, you know a big contributor to that park and everyone was pretty appalled by the so it sounds like suggestion. maybe there needs to be and I I hate to say it but another meeting where there is you know what are the options what are what are the needs and what are the options and what what can be done because it sounds to me like the city owns it the city is planning on going forward with it and yet there is a part of our community that is going we don't think this is a good idea am i correct yes so is there some way that th this can turn into and i hate to say charrette because i don't like charrettes but a way that the community and the decision makers can all be decision makers so when I spoke to Mr. Sargent, I offered to go and present a full presentation sure. to his board. He said that we didn't need to do that, but we may need to do that later on. So that offer still stands. I would be glad to go present to the board our would, reasoning, our would, options, and why we wish to you? do so. Uh, now, that, again, I will say this, that is as a courtesy. Surely. We own that property. We have master planned it for a specific right. use. I and, understand that, but I also so, say- And we're wanting to be nice about it. Yes, you are, you are a staff member mm -hmm. employed by the city of El Paso. That is correct. Through our, our taxes, am yes. I correct? That is correct. So that you are virtually, and staff, who are wonderful and really get things moving but when I hear you say we own it, we own it. Yes. You're right. And I speak we, we the as city the city of El Paso. We, we as the it. city. Yes. yes. And I understand, but I'm trying. I'm trying to get this so that there can be some commonality and and the citizens in the area can feel that input has been truly heard. So I would, and it's, it's not even a recommendation that I can make but it might be something to s sorely consider that uh, the group get together. Uh, legal, help me out, please. So I, if I understand the situation, Mr. Vialva has already offered to make a presentation yes. to this to the group. Yes. And I believe it's up to the group to take him up on that offer. And then he'll share what information he can about the plan for this property, which Thank is you. a city-owned facility. Yes. I mean, public facilities. So maybe this would be a way to to get things moving in where it's not a we, they, it's ours, because it is ours. Right. And, and uh, so maybe can you work with Mr. Galvan, can your people and her people get together on this in some way? I mean, I hate to put it that way, I but that's... I think it needs to be We're more waiting than for Mr. Sargent to reply to our initial... My concern, Madam initial. Chairman, excuse me. My concern, Madam Chairman, is that this is an open space concern because we have long talked in this committee about uh, buffer spaces right. around our open space. And this land is owned by the city. Correct. So we have to consider working together to get a win-win as much as possible instead of a I gotcha. Right. So that that is what I would recommend as Mr. Galvan has offered to come Villalba, to. Sorry. I'm sorry? Villalba. Villalba. Oh, I'm so okay. sorry. I, I don't hear well. I mean, it's one of those age things. What can I it's say? Okay. Mr. Villalba. Miss Burt, would that would that help at all? Yes, but not just with the board. There's so many other people involved. You Absolutely. Know, like you said, there's just a lot of different people, the Junior League, the Rotary Club who helped build it. Uh, there's just a lot of entities. Just our very tiny Keystone board is not really the uh, right decision maker for the future of that property. Possibly developing a list of who the right decision makers are to be present would be helpful. Pardon me? 
Who are the stakeholders? Who are the stakeholders? You know, the stakeholders need to, to be able to give input and hear and work on this together. So that would be a possible way of doing this. And we can look at, hopefully, there is nothing going on as far as transferring land anymore or anything like that between now and February. Maybe we can get some more information in February. Yes, that would be helpful. Okay, I'll put it on the, board, on the agenda for sure. I would appreciate sure. that. Okay, maybe we can, you've, you've already offered. You think you can find Wait. a place in your schedule, maybe. We're waiting to hear back from Mr. Sargent. Great. Okay, that sounds very positive. Thank you. Yes. A long of time. Yes. Yes. And they've sent it for for many years, as you said, uh, and it's been recommended to city council and so on that that property, that little square that was up there, that should be a buffer. And in the plans that the city presented to our board several years back, they felt like 20 feet was a buffer. But anybody who can pace off 20 feet knows that's not really a buffer. It would destroy the birds. So that are uh, shorebirds that breed and lay their eggs on the ground. So, excuse me, I don't, from what you're saying, I don't think Mr. Sargent fully conveyed what our offer was. Because if you're talking about just that little dirt piece of property right there, well, I that, see that is in our plans for a different no use. What you're pointing to. Well, your map. Yeah, but I. But the, path, the property right across, there's a road and then well, there's I, a dirt. Where, yes. So on the bottom that, right corner, that dirt lot. That square. Yes. Yes. That is not part of our plans. I understand. For using. So. I understand. So if you're. But you're not only that, on, but then there was a three-acre buffer, which is much different than twenty feet. For. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt you, so but I, 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 would just I, like I think to you're getting into the weeds Sargent. on this, and uh -huh. and we yeah. really need a little bit more for you all, more time for you all to, your groups to get together and you to make your presentation and them right. to, to look at your options. And I'd like to put this on the agenda for um, next month. Thank you. So that we can have something um, to look forward to. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, shall we go on to number nine now then? So good afternoon, Jeff Howell, Planning and Inspections. Uh, to begin my presentation uh, with these maps that we've created, um, FEMA, uh, we did look at it, and FEMA does not designate uh, arroyos. They instead designate uh, flood zones mm -hmm. and uh, flow paths. Mm -hmm. And so these maps were created using that uh, FEMA flood zone and flow path information that we have, um, which originally was from 2006 and has been updated periodically over time, um, but it does not uh, include, again, the most recent um, updated CLOMARS and LOMARS and things like that, but, but it has been updated since 2006. And so the dark blue uh, areas on this map show where the flow paths and the flood zones mm -hmm. intersect, uh, while the lighter teal color just shows the flood zones. And since an arroyo is really uh, more of the gully or the depression of where that water flows, that's why we chose to show them intersecting um, because FEMA, the way they designate flow paths and they depict it on a map is just with a line. And since, a, since an arroyo is really just an area, um, that's why we chose to show them uh, where those two um, uh, data information sets intersect. And so um, we created a series of maps showing this and we've broken uh, the city down into three different areas and we showed the district information as well. And so one map, this map in particular, shows the uh, ownership of the land in which those arroyos and flood zones cross. It shows the, uh, the private land ownership, city, PSB, and then the uh, Franklin Mountain State Park. And then the other maps that we have show the zoning information, which shows uh, the typical development that uh, could potentially go there, with that being residential, commercial, um, manufacturing. Um, and then 
Uh, we also tried to display this uh, in a way in which you could see through the information just because um, since it is covering such a large area, mm -hmm. uh, ownership might change within the arroyo or zoning might change, and so that's why we've depicted it this way. Mm -hmm. And so this map in particular is the uh, north part of the city, showing uh, primarily District 1 and District 4, again with the ownership uh, information. And this second map here is that same area of the city, instead with the zoning information. And this map shows the uh, central part of the city with districts uh, 1, 8, 4, 2, and 3 primarily represented here. Mm -hmm. And this is the ownership information and the zoning information. And then this is the uh, final set. This is more of the east side area with uh, di representative districts uh, 2, 3, 5, 6, and 7 primarily. Uh, and this is the ownership information and the zoning information. And so with that, that concludes my uh, presentation. And if you have any questions, we are happy to answer them. Are there any questions or statements from the board? From the audience. Marilyn Guida, I, it would be wonderful for the public to have access to that map somehow and to study it because it's great to have the information, you know, that was presented, but I can't, hard to make heads or tails out of it, you know, this quick. Um, I did notice a spot um, at, the, at the, the west end of Hondo Pass, where Hondo Pass dead ends and private property begins, but there's a water utilities um, drainage that's that's then mountainside that's uh, it's not it's privately owned land not uh, not state park but there's there's drainage there channels that take that water uh, and dump it onto Kasner range okay and that so that's probably I don't know if it's technically an arroyo uh, because probably before Hondo Pass was put in that flowed down toward Hondo Pass area but at any rate that that carries stormwater it's not on the map. So there's there's details like that. I'm not sure why OSAB requested this information, but anyway, that's that's it for me. Thank you. Marilyn Guida. Call. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Howell. Well, and I can clarify, uh, Jeff Howell again for the record, and, and this information is uh, what we had from uh, FEMA, again, from or originating from the 2006 information and going. So that's that might be possibly why it's not it's not shown on the map. OSAB is responsible for giving information in advisory on arroyos, greenways, and other open spaces. And that was one of the reasons why this this map was requested because um, a lot of us don't know where all of these arroyos are. And it, sometimes it helps to have the map. Maybe, is this something that could be put on the uh, city's website? Um, that's something we can look into to see. Okay. Just so that if you're in District 6, you know what's available out there, what, what arroyos are there. And since this information is uh, from the flood zone information, I believe that map information is on the city website already. Sure. And so uh, that's how some people could access this information because this information, again, since it is derived from that, mm -hmm. it's, it should be there. It's the first time I've seen it and I'm really impressed. Thank you. Okay, number six. Uh, number 10. This is information discussion. It's a recommendation to city council to consider the green infrastructure report presented to the Open Space Advisory Board on December 6th. And I have uh, drafted a memorandum, and I believe it was in the drop box. Yes. It was sent as a supplemental. Yes, here it is. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, do I, uh, legal, do I need to read this entire thing orally? Thank you. No, no you, the, the, the memorandum, I believe, was provided as backup as part of the agenda. 
Right. So the members of the, the public would have had notice of what you were proposing to read. Right. Um, you can read the subject line so that it's a, it's a good preface to you, your, your conversation or the discussion that you'll have. Okay, thank you. Uh, the subject is recommendation to City Council to direct the City Manager to direct staff to provide the green infrastructure report, again, uh, presented to the Open Space Advisory Board on December 6, 2017. Uh, to city, this is to be provided to both City Council and the El Paso Water Utilities Public Service Board. The upshot of the whole thing is the last three paragraphs, if I may. Uh, whereas basic knowledge of current development and design options on how new development impacts open space, greenways, arroyos, and wilderness areas in their natural state within El Paso or its extraterritorial jurisdictions would be considered best practice in decision making for El Paso City Council and the El Paso Water Utilities Public Service Board and whereas on January 10th, 2018, Open, Open Space Advisory Board voted blank to make the following recommendation. Now therefore be it recommended that City Council to direct the City Manager to direct staff to provide the Green Infrastructure Report presented to the Open Space Advisory Board on December 6, 2017 to City Council and the El Paso Water Utilities Public Service Board at the earliest, most appropriate date possible following this meeting. Are there any questions? Do we need um, to have a second on this? I move the recommendation go forward. Second. Okay. There's a, been a, uh, a motion and a second that this recommendation go forward. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay. As it stands, this recommendation will go forward then. It will be provided to uh, the city manager and also I can we be sure that our city reps and the um, representatives and the mayor get a copy of this? How do we how do we get this out to them and also to um, the water utilities? Um, through the, uh, you can deliver the chair can deliver it personally to the um, city manager and the city council reps. Okay. Through their staff. Okay. Or and if you want to provide it to us, um, we can deliver it for you. That would be lovely. And to the water utilities, how can we get that to them? So that they're made aware that this might would be coming their way. We can provide a copy to them as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So, unanimously. Thank you. Are there any other bits of information that we need to address at this time? We do have an item for executive session. Okay, we do have an item for executive session, you're right. Shall we, that being the case, then we will adjourn to, adjourn executive to session. meet in an executive session. Can we go back in the little room? Yep. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, excuse me, Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. I neglected to say you need to vote to go into executive right. session. Oh. First. We uh, go to executive session. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those Aye. opposed? Okay. We go into executive session. Darn, I thought we were going to get out of here early. Sharon, I'm so sorry I was late. You know, blame it on Textile. So be it. So be it. But I called him on it. Uh, there's your piece. Thank you so much. And we need to get an executive.
Wait. Yes, I did. I gave you two. Okay. All in favor. All in favor of. Aye. 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 And in fact, I gave okay, you now. two. Somebody oh, else's now table. we move that we adjourn this meeting. But you could check that time if you want. To. All yes. in favor you of adjourning the this meeting. Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Oh, I didn't give anybody a chance to, to have a discussion. Forget it. Forget well, it. you know, I <laughs> think we ought to stay here. <laughs> the meeting is adjourned. Can we talk about it? Yeah, I'd like committee. to talk about it. <laughs> the meeting is adjourned. I, I wish to thank staff tremendously. You guys are great. Thank committee. you. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, really, well, but no. you know, we're, 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 it's a good let's idea be nice. to let's not make keep it going. Whatever.